all command and control or we are completely ad hoc or we are either completely distributed or we are all centrally controlled. Now when companies go through this in a series, they end up in these overlapping oscillations that make people sick, right? Because people are wobbling back between these two poles and it takes up a lot of mental cycles. It really destroys productivity in organizations. The cause of this is often that there's delayed feedback. People don't have quick enough feedback to understand when there are problems. And then when they see a problem that is too far gone, and while they may pull the right lever, they pull it too hard. And they go back to the other pole, and they end up in this oscillating pattern again. I've seen this in organizations repeat over time. We're going to have empowered teams. Now we're going to have manager-led teams. We're going to have distributed power. Now we're going to have centralized control. We're going to have adaptive planning. Now we're going to have deterministic planning. And it just goes in this great wobble that is very, very unproductive and very difficult. <clears throat> the truth is that in most organizations, managers don't want this. They don't want the upside and downside of one polarity, of the centralization. Nor do they want this. They don't want the up and the downside of decentralization, or distributed control, or self-organizing teams as opposed to manager-led teams. The truth is that in order for systems to be highly functional, there has to be a balance. Right? It has to balance the needs of central control and the need for robust self-organizing in the subsystems. This is from some work by Danella Meadows. What that implies is that what the organizations really want, what the managers and organizations really want, is they want the upsides of both of those polarities. So this is one of the first ways I see I see organizations fail at Agile. They start in one direction, they don't have adequate feedback loops, they don't have an adequate understanding of what the controls that are absolutely necessary are. They panic, they pull back, and they go to the opposite extreme. There's another sort of variation on this that Johanna touched on this morning, where you have this change model. You guys remember the change model that she drew for you? Yes? Um, very often, people at, in organizations have, uh, well, let's just say senior managers in organizations, have a mental model of change that says change happens like this. Or sometimes I think it just happens like this. You know, we say, OK, we're going to do Agile. Um, and when they look down and see that some parts of the organization are, the, the performance is very erratic, they panic, right? They panic and they pull back. So it can happen either because people feel things are out of control or because people then look and see that things are not going as smoothly as they had hoped, panic and pull back. So what, what can change this is having some robust feedback loops in place, ones that give you a mirror into the system so that you can see how the system is doing and make smaller adjustments as you find things are shifting in the organization, perhaps in a way that you don't want them to go. Those indicators need to be around the system. They need to not be targets, which almost always drive dysfunction. They need to be things that help you understand really what's happening in the system. And I find that companies need to balance three basic things. They need to balance um, the needs of the stakeholders. And shareholders are a subset of stakeholders, right? Stakeholders can be the community. They can be um, you know, a larger era, uh, market they, that they live in. Um, shareholders often get precedence among stakeholders, but they are not the only stakeholders. They need to manage to, to look at balance the needs of their customers, and they need to balance the needs of their employees. So, what what sort of indicators 
come to mind for you that might help a company know something about one of these three aspects? Yeah. Net promoters for us. Yeah, the answer was next net promoters, right? Which is some interesting work that has come out of a guy whose name has just absolutely escaped me. But he has looked at it and said um, that really it doesn't matter um, you know, how people fill out their customer satisfaction surveys. What really matters in our current environment is how many people are enthusiastically promoting your company? How many people are telling their friends and colleagues about your product and recommending their, your product to them? To, to, their, to their friends or colleagues. On the other end of the extreme are the people who are putting, putting up videos on YouTube talking about how crappy your product is. Right? <coughs> so you look at the net between those two, between your detractors and your promoters, and that gives you some sense of how you're doing with your customers. Do you happen to remember that guy's name? Fred Reichel. Say that daughter, please. Fred Reichel from the Bain Company. Fred Reichel. So, Interesting work on looking at how you're really satisfying your customers. Because that game has changed, right? It's no longer enough to just produce goods and services. You really have to be looking at delighting your customers. And that net promoter score is one of the more interesting ways I've found to get at that. Who else has an idea about how you, how you might measure some of these, how you might have a window into some of these? Yeah, I mean, it, it, employee retention can be a really interesting one, right? Um, and you have to look at the reason why people are staying. Um, I uh, worked for a company many, many years ago when I was a corporate employee that one of the divisions was uh, really struggling. So they brought in a new vice president who was going to save the day. And um, one of the first things she did was hold an all hands um, during which she said, my first job here is to get rid of the dead wood. We are going to be searching out the dead wood and pruning it from our tree. So what do you think happened in that case? Well, there was an interesting sort of turnover, right? Right, because a lot of people looked at it and said, um, it's going to get really ugly here. I'm just going to keep my head down and do, you know, do what I can to hold on to this job. And the people who felt like they had really good prospects went elsewhere. So retention can be an excellent one, but you have to know why people are staying, right? Other ideas about what kind of metrics might be helpful in, the, in understanding what's going on here? Yeah. Yeah, repeat business from existing customers, because almost all of the um, data on that shows that it is monstrously more expensive to get a new customer than to sell to an existing customer. Yeah, so it's another one that tells you about customers. Some other ideas, yeah? Um, what percentage of your customers are prepared to be uh, reference sites? For, uh... Okay, reference sites, with well, a percent of customers that are prepared to be reference sites. Stock prices. Stock prices, yes, um, and that gets to the shareholder subset of the stakeholders. And I think we have seen in the U.S. that sometimes paying a lot of attention to your stock price can actually reduce the viability and the value and destroy value of your company over time. So it's one to look at, but to look at with some caution and to be careful about how you're, how you're looking at Sometimes it's just looking at year-over-year um, -year performance, right? Are we doing better than we did last year, right? Have we been able to make some improvements? Um, so those are some, some measures that help you balance this triangle. Great ideas for the group. Um, and much more lively to have someone saying them other than just me going up here all day. So those are some things to look at. If you're looking at it in terms of your agile adoption, and you're looking at what metrics you want to be looking at for how your agile adoption is doing, 
Um, I think there's a different set of things that you want to look at to see how your organizational system is going. And I tend to like to look at what is the ratio of value work over fixing work. Because that tells you that you are doing things right the first time rather than doing a lot of rework. And it helps you focus on finding the underlying causes of, of rework. And if you can eliminate some of those, you have an automatic boost in productivity. Right? So if you can, if you can shift that ratio of, of, of value work to fixing work, you can get an automatic boost. So that's one that I like to look at. I like to look at cycle time which tells you how long it takes for an idea to get a product out the door. Right? And that's telling you how, you know, how quickly you can deliver value to your customers and bring money into your organization. Um, I like to look at, um, I just drew a complete blank. Um, defects reduced in, uh, in, that get out in, released into production. Right, because those are the ones that are really expensive in most cases, and those are the ones that can really affect your image in the in the workplace. Right? It's important to look at reducing defects in many places, but those are the ones that really have an impact um, to your organization, right, in terms of your your outside perception. So, those metrics, along with the indicators that you you talked about for the exterior, will give you a robust set of feedback loops that will help you take action. Um, in a timely way, help you know, give you a window into your system so you have some idea what levers to pull. And you can get out of that oscillating pattern. Right, so that's the first failure mode. Panic and pullback, going from pole to pole, wobbling in an oscillating pattern as you shift strategies. Any questions about this? Uh, so the question is, uh, for value work versus fixing work, what do I see as a healthy ratio and what do I see as a typical ratio? Um, you know, I don't actually have uh, numbers on that. I think that, uh, again, it's not so much a target as it's are we improving, right? Are we shifting that ratio? I, I did recently talk to um, a company that had 70% fixing work and 30% value work. Which, I don't know, does that sound good to you guys? I think it depends on the state of the product. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the state of the product, yeah. The stage. The stage. So once it's mature, there are not much more. So you need to add it, maybe not. Well, that's true. So the insight is that it depends on the life stage of the product. That if you have um, if you have a product that is, is quite old, you won't be um, adding new features. You'll probably be keeping it going. However, if that's true for your organization as a whole, then I think it, it still tells you there's some significant problems. Right? And I might begin to wonder, you know, if you're spending that much time on fixing work, if it might be time to retire the product. Well, I might start wondering about that. But it's an interesting way to look into your organization. Right? Look into that. Other questions <clears throat> about these indicators? Yeah? I was just thinking that you could generalize the definition of stakeholders to include customers and employees. And I'm wondering why you kind of take those two out of that uh, definition. Yeah, so the question is, um, you could generalize stakeholders to include both employees and customers. Um, and I, you could, but I think you'd lose some really important um, information. Right, sometimes, um, you know, you have to look at what the information loss is when you aggregate. And my experience is that when you aggregate shareholders to include both of those other groups, you just, you, you miss too much useful information about your system. Right? Um, it would be easy to, uh, to have an average that looked great and you'd be finding out that your employees were either disenchanted uh, or your customers were disenchanted. Right? So those are the three things that I, in my experience and in, in quite a bit of the literature, show up as being 
really the things you have to balance to keep your company healthy. Yeah. Okay. So the second failure mode is success at a local level that doesn't spread beyond you know, the frontline workers, beyond the team level, because of structures, policies, and procedures and mindsets that are prevalent in the larger system. So for one example, I talked to um, I talked to folks in an organization where the teams were actually quite successful in adaptive planning and working, understanding their velocity and making adjustments um, on the release level up until the time that it was close to when they were actually going to release, and then everything went to hell. Right? Then it was all bets are off. You know, you have to get this feature done. Doesn't matter if you're if you're doing on the death march. It doesn't matter if you're working 90 hours a week. And that pattern repeated in the organization. And it turned out that while the teams were being told to track your velocity and commit only to what you can do, the managers were still being held accountable for delivering fixed scope to a fixed date. And so when it got close to delivery date, they looked at you know, their interests, their bread and butter, their bonus, and said, okay, you've got to make this work. Okay. So in that case, you have a reward structure and a, an idea about <coughs> commitment and targets that is working actively against adaptive planning flowing up into the organization. And I see this a lot. Does this match your experience? that it, it, it goes so high and then it stops. Um, I ran into another another group that, well, I, I should make a caveat here when I talk about these companies that are doing silly things is, you know, I, I get called in when companies have problems that they haven't been able to figure out how to fix on their own. So it's it's not that there are only horrible companies out there. It's just I, my standard <coughs> sometimes is a little bias towards that. But there, there was another company that um, asked their teams to um, use agile methods and commit to what they could do in an iteration and deliver. And the teams were doing reasonably well at that. They had established that their, their, um, their velocity for roughly, uh, for their two week sprints was roughly 20 points. It went up and down, up and down a little in the range, but you know, pretty consistently that. Um, and their CIO, had a stated policy of never saying no to the business. So that meant that that responsibility of saying no to the business devolved to the lowest level and to the people with the least power, right? the people on the development teams, which meant that the people in the business tended to blame the people in the development teams as being stupid, being lazy, not being able to follow through on their commitments, they weren't accountable, they weren't responsible, all of this stuff. Um, but it was really at the top level of the organization where that precedent was being set of promising everything, not making hard decisions, not thinking through the trade-offs, not having difficult conversations, avoiding conflict, but pushing it to another part of the organization where there was the least power. Um, the, um, the, the managers in that organization had promised a release with something like 600 um, points of functionality in it. And the development teams had been working along, working as, as hard as they could, given all the obstacles that they were facing. And they were something like six weeks from release, and there was still something like 400 points to deliver. Okay. Anybody can do the arithmetic on that? Yeah. Anybody? I can't do arithmetic in public either, like just like Diana. I don't know what it is. I can't do it. Right, yeah. So, so I mean, everybody in that company could do the math, and the developers are just saying, you know, you, you asked us to, to track velocity. Right, you asked us to track velocity, and, and this is our velocity, and this is what we can do, and we can't do that. And their manager said, but you've got to try. <laughs> At which point they lost all respect for their manager, and he lost all credibility. Right? Because he was not there to back them up, and he was not there to have the hard conversations. 
because the tone had been set at the top and they were, um, you know, they weren't really being set up. So this sort of dynamic plays out in a lot of different ways. Um, it happens when people have fixed budgets, right, or budget targets that they have to meet and they don't account for adaptive planning. It happens when there is a fixed portfolio plan um, with all sorts of commitments and bonuses and incentives and so forth tied to it um, that is immutable and there is not rigorous adaptive planning all the way up. It happens when there are um, reward structures that still are rewarding heroic um, star behavior uh, or rewarding individuals who in someone's perception are top performers even though they are not uh, necessarily respected by their peers or effective working in groups. So that's another area where this tends to happen is when we have reward structures that are still aligned with fixed performance contracts carried out by individuals and cascading goals and objectives that go throughout the organization. So something we sometimes forget is that in, 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 in terms of system language, the original purpose of a hierarchy is always to support the originating subsystems do their job better. And that's true in organizations too. If you think of most organizations when they start out, they're flat. Everybody does a little bit of everything. Everybody's you know, pitching in, getting the work, there aren't a lot of titles, there aren't a lot of formal roles. And when the company gets a little bigger, they sometimes say, well, we need professional managers. And they bring in managers and they install a hierarchy. With the intent of being helpful to those subsystems. And if the mindset that comes with those professional managers is one of looking at financial numbers only, and having a deterministic view of management, that the role of management is to get some unskilled people to work harder, um, you're going to end up with a situation where it's the, the, the hierarchy forgets that its purpose is to serve the ability of the, the lower levels of the system to work effectively. And it becomes inversed. And the, the people at the lower levels are expected to serve the needs of the hierarchy rather than vice versa. So in order to be really effective, um, we need to have coherence across the system. So that the um, adaptive planning is supported by um, adaptive planning up and down the organization, um, by relative improvement goals rather than targets, because targets always become the de facto method for work and by robust feedback loops that help people understand what's going on in the system and make small adjustments and small improvements. Right? Does this make sense? Part of what contributes to the issues around um, Agile succeeding at a local level but not at a higher level in the organization has to do with um, a fact of hierarchy, which is that hierarchy filters and distorts information, right? Things get progressively rosier as things go up the organization. So the people at the top may not have accurate information. So I told, I told this story yesterday, so uh, forgive me if you're hearing it for the second time, but um, years and years ago I did a retrospective for a company that had worked for four years on the product that was supposed to save the company four years. Um, and when it was an embedded system that was running some, you know, a piece of, I can't say the name of the equipment because that would be obvious with what, but um, they worked on this for four years. And when they put it into the test bed, not a belt moved, not a lever flap, not a door opened. And they decided they had to learn, they had to figure out why they had gotten to this state of four, working for four years, believing everything was on track, and then um, finding out that it was really not anywhere close to being on track. So I did a four day retrospective with them. And towards the end of the retrospective, when people had begun to feel some safety and that they could um, 
actually talk about what really had happened for them. And believe me, it took some work to get them to that stage. People were pretty angry at the start of it. I asked people to line up um, based on when they knew the project was in trouble. You know, and if this is three and a half years ago, and this is, oh, um, when it went into the test bin, how do you think people lined up? Yeah? Well, it was interesting, because a lot of, of the managers were over here. The, the senior managers were here. The middle managers were here. And the developers were over here. Right. So hierarchy distorts information. Right? And if we want to, um, to have a better picture of what's happening on projects so we don't end up in that one, we have to work in short iteration so we have feedback. But we have to make it safe for people to say what is really happening on projects. Right? We have to create, a, create an environment where we can have that sort of transparency and people don't feel that they have to make things rosier and rosier as it goes up there because they don't want to be the one to deliver bad news. The other thing about this um, bifurcation of knowledge is that um, people at the top of the organization tend to have very robust knowledge about <coughs> their markets, their strategies, their customers, why they're in business, what the operational factors of the business are, why they're launching certain products at certain times. And the people in the bottom of the organization know, just like those folks who are over here on this side of that little scale, they know what it takes to get things done day to day. Right. And there's not a bunch of overlap. Right? That little diamond represents the overlap. And if we want to have a more success with Agile, we need to make that diamond bigger. Right? This is a, this ties back to the hitting the clay layer, but also ties back to the oscillating pattern, where if people have better information about strategy and about um, market and about customers, they'll make better decisions in self-organizing teams. If teams don't understand the context of the market, they won't make very good decisions. Likewise, if the people at the top of the organization don't have information about what, re what it really takes to get work done, they're likely to make some decisions that seem rather foolish to the people lower in the hierarchy. Right? So we need to make that diamond bigger. One of the ways we do that is by making it safe for transparency. Any questions about that hierarchy? Have you ever seen this or this bifurcation? Has anyone seen this play out in their organization? Yeah. One, one of the things you, the signs I hear is when people will say, well, it's just a database. When the manager will say, it's just a database. What's the problem? It's just a database. Right? Anytime you hear the word just stop, it's a, it's a sign that people don't understand what's really going on in the world. And when people don't understand the work, they tend to look for signs of activity rather than signs of real, real things being accomplished. Okay. So we need to make the diamond bigger. Um, on on the, the people who are doing the day-to-day -day work, I think it's really important for people to understand how the company makes money. Right? I used to work in the financial services industry. And um, when options were first coming out and being traded, uh, it, it was a little difficult for people to wrap, wrap their heads around it. And, and some of the programmers I was working with said, well, these are difficult. It's going to you know, take us a long time to figure this out. And you know, it's going to cost a lot. It's really hard. It's going to cost a lot. It's really difficult. You should just tell them not to bother with options. Because they didn't have the contextual information to understand how important options were to that organization, right? And to, and to the financial services industry. That, by the way, was when they were just starting to come out with all those mortgage tranches. And back, you, you remember those, and the fund they brought us in the US? Yeah, well, nobody could actually figure out how to price them, right? Back in the 80s, right? So, I mean, I think that should have been a sign. But anyway, they didn't listen. 
Okay, so people need to know um, what the business proposition, so what the value proposition of the business is, so that they, on the low, on the lower levels and the hierarchy, can make good decisions. Um, I, I, I like this kind of shorthand to do it. This is from um, Off the World and Penures business model canvas, but it's just a quick shorthand to say what's our value proposition for our customers, how do we maintain a relationship, what are the channels that we use, what are our key partnerships, that's what those two little gold rings are, what are our key partnerships for our people, what are our tools and, and resources, what's our cost structure, how do we make money. So how many people proportionally do you think could lay that out for your company or your division. Sometimes companies have many of these, right? But how many people do you think could lay that out in your company? 100%? Very few. Very few. Yeah, well, this is the kind of information that helps keep people from making stupid decisions or, or decisions that seem stupid if you have the contextual knowledge. Right, but may make perfect sense given the level of knowledge they have. So I am told that um, everybody at, at Amazon knows how they make how Amazon makes money. Right, and Amazon makes money in a bunch of different ways. Um, I know they make money off selling me books. Right, but if you look at it, they're discounting quite heavily. Right, so you wonder how can they discount these books and still make money? How many of you know how they make money on selling books? Pardon? Um, no, they're not, they're, Amazon isn't actually paying royalties, I think. Yeah. Shipping fees sometimes? Uh, I, I don't know if that's the major way. Maybe they bring traffic to their website then. Well, they do bring traffic to their website and they know a lot about how um, each click relates to money. And e right. it's another business, right? And they have their own outlet. Right. So they have a ecosystem going on there. Yes. The main way, the main business of, of selling books on Amazon makes money is through the float. Because they turn their inventory faster. So they're making money on the float. They're holding money, getting interest on it before they have to pay the suppliers. And everybody in Amazon knows that. So they don't make any decisions that interfere with that flow. They make decisions, even at the lowest levels of the organization, on how can we turn something into a sale? How can we turn it into a sale? And they do very, very rigorous testing on how to make sure that they are optimizing that. And that's because everybody knows. So if everybody here is company new, do you think they'd make better decisions? Expand the diamond. Conversely, um, people at the top of the organization often don't know how the work really works. I had a, we had a sort of interesting experience. Um, um, Johanna and I had an interesting experience the other morning of, of the people at the hotel not really knowing how some of the stuff worked at the hotel. Because um, they, uh, we discovered that the treadmills didn't work and we went down and we said that to them. And they said, oh, well, we've known that for several days. And I said, well, did you realize that one of them is quite dangerous? And they had no idea. Because I imagine they went in there and they turned it on and then they saw the belt move. So they said, well, you know, it's okay. But once you stepped on it, you know how the belt is supposed to just move in this direction, right? It also moved this way which means that any time you, you put your foot down on it, you were on an unstable ground, and that's very dangerous. But my guess is that they didn't go and find out, right? They took a cursory look, and they didn't go and find out how dangerous it really was. And this happens, um, this, you know, this is not uncommon. Managers are busy. They've got a lot of stuff coming at them. They're pressed by their managers. So if they go and find out, they take a cursory look, and they may not understand what's going on. So um, one of the guys uh, at, it was, this is actually the same company where the CIO would not um, say no to anybody. The, 
I asked the manager what their um, test, you know, how their how their work was flowing through their teams, and this is the picture he drew for me, roughly, roughly this picture. So they had a backlog, and it was assigned to developers in priority order, and then anyone could work on any piece of work, and that was because that's very efficient, and. Um, you know, then it would just go to testing, and it would be released, and they'd make money. Does this look familiar? All right, so this is what he thought it was like. And this is what it was really like. That they had something like 256 packets, and various developers specialized in different packets, and they would know a handful that they could do. But if they didn't know it, and they got it in, in priority order, they would have to go find the person who understood it and go talk to them and understand what was wanted. And then they would have to um, go and fix it and maybe ask some more questions. And then they would send it to testing. And the person in testing might not know what was going, so they'd come and ask another question. And they'd have to go, they'd first go to the person that usually did the work. And then they'd be told to go to the person who was doing it now. And then they'd have to go back together to talk to the person who knew the packet. Um, and in the meanwhile, while that back and forth was going on, they were getting production requests. They were having customers asking for favors or managers asking for favors. They were having you know, various um, kerfuffles with uh, the folks in support. So instead of having this nice, neat queue, the very effective queue, um, they had a multi-network queue. Instead of having fungible resources where everybody could work on everything, they had people who had specializations. Um, they had interdependent work. And it was not at all surprising that things were taking long, taking as long as they were. But this was quite a revelation. That, did I say that right? Is that a revelation? Revelation? Yeah. Well, he was relatively unclear about how the work worked. Um, and then he had a re revelation and understood that it was kind of nothing like he thought it was. So when folks, um, folks describe a problem with the work, you know, it's good to go and find out. Right? If, if they say that the build is slow, it's good to go and find out how long it really takes and why it's really taking that long. Right? It's good to know. It's good to get some sense of what it's like to get work done in your organization, if you're a manager. It doesn't mean you need to know how to code. I actually knew a, a senior vice president who was, was a really big guy. He's like 6'4", and really, really big, and he's you know, really fit. He rides his bike to work every day when the weather's decent. Um, and he would, he would, he thought it was just a great thing to go in Get off, the, get off his bike and on his way to the executive washroom to take a shower, just walk down beside someone and start coding with them. How do you think that people really like them? One, there's this big sweaty guy in his bike shorts, which is sort of alarming. <laughs> and two, you know, they were like, oh, you know, I, I, I don't want to say anything. You know, so it wasn't really a, a a learning experience for them. It was an experience of intimidation. So I'm not saying you have to know the code. I don't think that's necessarily useful to know in the exact level of to, to be able to execute the job. But you need to understand how the work works. Right? So when we can increase that diamond so that there's more knowledge, when we can have radical transparency through short iterations and through the ability to tell what is really happening in an organization, then we start removing some of those barriers. When we look at the policies that are holding the current patterns in place, when we look at the structures that are holding the current patterns in place, then we can start getting ourselves out of this second failure mode, which is working at the local level but stopping when you get it, when you run into the policies and procedures. Does that make sense? Questions about this? Yes. And about radical transparency, I can see how that you can make that work through, um, you know, uh, product cues and those, or product, you know, burnout charts and those kinds of things. But in other situations where there's a culture where whistleblowing is not, you know, encouraged, mm -hmm. do you, I mean, do you need to, in, in, 
So primarily when you're in that trans if, if you're in a transition to a more transparent organization. Do you advocate anything like, you know, uh, ability to anonymously give feedback or you know, suggestion box or anything like that? Do you need mechanisms during the transition so that you can see kind of get those red flag warnings ahead of time? Do you have any insight on it? Well, uh, so the, the question, did everyone hear that question? So if, how do you establish that sort of radical transparency? <coughs> and, you know, it is a social contract on, on, on a number of different levels, right? That if we're taking self-organizing teams and we're saying you have autonomy to do stuff, they also have responsibility to be transparent, right? And that's what we ask for when we have order queues and we have um, burn down charts and we are tracking velocity. That's asking them to take, you know, you have this autonomy and you also have a responsibility to be transparent about where your work is. And you're absolutely right. If there is a culture of blame and a culture of shoot the messenger, that won't last very long. Right. So, um, I think that Often, well-intentioned managers do things that subtly communicate that they don't want to hear any bad news. Right? So, um, when I hear managers say things like, don't come to me with a problem, come to me with a solution. How many of you have heard that one? <laughs> yeah. Um, that is actually not so subtly communicating. Um, I don't want to hear any bad news, and don't come to me with any problems that you don't know how to fix. Right? Well, I don't know about you, but I, I never went to my manager if to solve a problem if I knew how to fix it. Right? I just fixed it. So that's one thing, the way people use language. Right? Um, another, another kind of catchphrase I hear managers use is failure is not an option. Right? Well, it's always a possibility. And the more you're thinking is that it's not an option, the more likely it is to happen, actually. So, so part of it is shifting the language, right? And part of it is, um, in many organizations, um, people are expected to prove and have conclusive proof, right, before they take any management. So um, bring me the data, and then we can have a logical conversation. I actually heard a manager say that once. And it, there wasn't data, there was just a hunch. Right? I have, something just doesn't feel right here. Right? Something doesn't feel right. So I try to teach managers to be open to hunches and say, well, okay, let's figure out how we can get some more information about that. Right? So I, I, have, I teach managers how to, um, how to ask about hunches in a way that doesn't shut people down. And I teach people how to speak up about hunches in a way that um, they have at least something to go on. So that's one thing I do. Um, sometimes I will have, um, I'll, I'll have a chat with people and, and, or coach people to have a chat with their managers um, and say, you know, if I knew something was going wrong with this release or this project, when would you want to know about it? And no one ever answers that question at the last moment. They always say, well, as soon as you move. And that makes that gives implicit permission to raise on problems. Right? The other thing I do, so I mean I, I look at the language people are using and I coach people on the language. I coach people to be open to hunches if things are going wrong and to listen to hunches and figure out how to get some data to back up hunches. People have the time to speak up. Um, teach managers to listen more. Because uh, you know, very often people who get into management are people who are, are good at talking. So they have to learn how to listen and sometimes listen between the lines. Um, and sometimes I use simple rules, which are a way to make um, values actionable. You know, there are rules that are, uh, apply across broad areas of the organization, across the hierarchy in many situations that guide interactions and decisions and the way people go about their work. Right? So in a case where I 
the organization had, was having issues around bringing up bad news, I might say, in this organization, we'd have to establish a, a, a rule for everyone that says raise the red flag early. Right? And I've done this with organizations that are having trouble recognizing risks and recognizing problems. That they, they just have a, they make a rule that says raise the red flag early. And then the managers have to manage their own fear and their own anxiety when someone does raise the flag. Because most of the time when managers are freaking out about bad news, it's because they're feeling um, threatened and vulnerable, right? Because someone's going to yell at them, right? And nobody wants to do that. Can I give you some ideas? Yeah, I, yeah. I, I could agree with everything you said. I think when it comes to the, that layer of middle management where people may be actually sabotaging or wanting to sabotage the effort because it is threatening, I, I mean, I think it, when you're in that transition phase, yeah. I think you've got to manage that very, very, very carefully. And I'm just wondering what mechanisms might work and when there might be a, because I, I know that I've heard of leaders who know how to go a few levels down and will like yeah. make a point to go get information further right. down. And that, you know, but I'm wondering if there's something else that, you know, is a good practice for the transition itself yeah. to well, identify, you know, to help sort of bypass the people who might otherwise be barriers. I know it's not a simple answer. No, it's not a simple answer. So the you know, you have to start by modeling it at the top. And you have to make it clear that the expectation is that other managers will model it. Right? And make sure that the reward structures that held the old pattern in place are changed. So that if when people um, find out late that something is going to not deliver or not deliver as planned or communicate that late, that that's not regarded as a success or acceptable. You know, I think in a lot of, certainly in US businesses, um, it is far more acceptable to be certain and dead wrong than to be uncertain and accurate, right? About, about, the, uh, about the ambiguity, right? And so I, th I think that has to be modeled and it has to be set as an expectation. Now, um, no matter how bad the situation is, it's good for somebody. And in some ways, um, you know, it's good for middle managers the way things have been, right? Uh, because they have been able to stop, you know, make their little part of the system work so that their goals are met and that they have access to scarce resources. Um, one of the things I'm, I'm looking at now and um, doing some small experiments with some clients is about disaggregating some of the power that managers, middle managers have which um, is threatening to them, right? But it also gives a path, right? Because right now, I think that managers fear that their jobs will go away completely. So managers get power from um, control of the budget, control of hiring and firing, control of promotions, control of um, plum assignments, control of who gets access to training, who gets access to um, you know, various perks, whose reputation is enhanced. And so that's a lot of power in one person. And if you can separate out some of those roles, like um, professional development and career path support, if you can have some of the money flow to the team, some of the budget responsibility flow to the teams when they have decision authority, like they can choose their own training within a certain budget or choose their own tools within certain boundaries. Um, that that um, reduces some of the power. Um, it removes one of the structures that keeps things in place. And it gives some other roles for managers to do. So like being a community of practice manager, um, being a component shepherd, so which is like a managing the architectural integrity of the system, um, focusing on career development of, of, of people. There's different ways to reframe those roles so that um, there is a way forward for people. Right? Does that help? Mm -hmm. And it's, you're right, it's yeah. not easy. It's absolutely not easy. Yes? Um, you're talking about uh, increasing size of uh, diamond to yes. uh, make communication kind of going uh, in the biggest streams. 
Uh, but the question I want to ask is that uh, sometimes people uh, on the ground and people on the top, the language is very different. And even if you make it bigger, they still don't understand each other. Like uh, developers saying databases, you mentioned, and, and uh, managers right. saying databases have different things. But even if we talk about objectives, uh, sales quarters, uh, and meeting, uh, meet, meeting our financial objective versus developers talking about developing uh, technical debt and all of that. So how do we do this translation with this? Otherwise, it's yeah, still not going to work. That's a very interesting uh, interesting point. It reminded me of something that uh, a colleague of mine, Don Gray, tweeted recently, which is, you know, we're not actually communicating person to person. We're communicating context to context. Right, and some of those, sometimes the contexts are so different that people don't understand across. Um, I actually find that, you know, going back to the little um, working through something like this is a great way to help people gain some overlap of their language and some understanding. Right, and I don't think it's possible. I don't think it's necessary for there to be a complete overlap. Right? There, but there has to be enough overlap so that um, people understand how work fits in. People understand why certain decisions are important. And people understand um, enough about how the company runs that, that they can connect to the company right, and have some kind of idea about how their work fits in. Yes, so, so it's not a perfect answer. Uh, well, this answer. will help uh, educate, uh, uh, let's say, development or technical engineering <coughs> team what biz how business works. Yeah. Uh, how to educate, from your experience, educate uh, executive team of how actually things work on the implementation level. So how do you get the converse? Um, yeah. I actually think some of those metrics around um, cycle time, um, ratio of fixing work to um, value work and um, defects released give executives an interesting um, window into the world, particularly when they can begin to understand some of the dynamics of how those things function, right? Because there are dynamics, predictable dynamics within software development organizations. And if they can use those as a window to understand how decisions affect those particular um, indicators, that is often enough of an understanding. Right. They don't need to know, you know, the difference between an object database and a relational database and all that other stuff. Um, but they do need to understand the dynamics of software development. Does that make sense? No, it's absolutely yeah. sense. It's not easy. No, no. Well, if it were easy, <laughs> we could all put it in a bottle and become rich. Rich, 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 rich. Okay. So, um, the third cause of failure in agile adoption that I run into um, has to do with uh, what I call death by a thousand compromises. And you look at something, you say, what were they thinking? And I think Johanna declined to say the word today. Whiskey Tango Foxtrot. <laughs> or Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So you just look and you say, what were they thinking? Well, you know, we know what they were thinking. We know what they were thinking. They were thinking in their existing mental model. So I bet there are a few of you in here who, uh, every year there are a few of us, but how many of you started out writing a procedural language when you were a developer? Yeah. And what did your first object-oriented program look like? It was procedural, right? Because you were just trying to work into a new mental model and you hadn't quite grokked how it worked. But your second one, if you, especially if you got a little coaching, took more advantage of object orientation, right? And then if you worked in a language that enforced it rather than allowed it, it got a little better. And pretty soon you got it. And that's just how our minds work. We always are trying to hang new information on our existing mental models. And this is what happens when folks are, are um, first of looking at agile methods and their implications outside of the development teams. 
and adapting them right back into their existing mental models because that's the calculus they have to follow. If this is like this, right? And if they don't understand the intent of a practice, and if they have never worked in tiny slices, and if they have never worked in an organization that had a model of servant leadership rather than a command and control hierarchical model, it's hard to dream into that, right? It's very hard to dream into that. So that's why it's helpful to have coaches, right? Right, because that mental model doesn't fit, right? He needed some help making a transition. Um, I find that someone who can focus on the essence rather than the mechanics of the pra of practices can be very helpful in helping people bridge that mental gap. I find that doing some small experiments and learning what you can from those can help people bridge that mental model and make that change, right? When I see, when I see teams that are trying to do a big bang, you know, we're going to take our entire thousand person organization and make it agile in 12 weeks, um, they often fail because people are struggling to fit it into the zone. We'll assume that people are trying, right? Many people are, some probably are not, but they're trying, some people are probably saying, this too shall pass. Um, and they're trying to fit it into an existing mental model, and they adapt it right back into what they've always known, particularly if the structures that hold those other patterns in place don't change. Right? So we've all seen this. You know, we've all seen um, agile adoptions that cherry pick the practices and say, oh, well, that thing wouldn't work for us here, right? Because it doesn't fit their existing mental model. And they lose the synergistic effects and the additive effects of uh, developing software that way. And sometimes people, um, just, you know, they get out the bucket of agile paint, slap a layer of paint on it. You know, sometimes they use brush instead of layer on it. Same, same sort of thing. I, mean, I, I was looking at a job description the other day that was like, I mean, I swear it was this long. It was for a scrum master. And I swear that the job description was this long. And how far down do you think anything mentioning um, cross-functional collaborative teams was? Right about here right about here, and then it was CSM. So they just slapped on a coat of agile paint, right? Because they, they were having trouble fitting <coughs> in how cross-functional, long life cross-functional teams having work flow to them in a steady way through an order, order queue worked. They'd never seen it, they never thought about it. Or if they had seen it, they weren't aware of what they were looking at, right? So they need some help making that shift. Okay, so yeah. I want to comment just on one thing you said. I, I hear what you're saying around the idea of, of cherry picking the, um, and uh, ad adopting the practices. Yeah. At the same time, I, I'd like us to be mindful maybe of just, you have to start somewhere. So I don't know that, I, I would question the word cherry picking. I, I appreciate, I, I am very mm -hmm. entrenched in cherry picking as well in certain areas. But sometimes taking a hybrid approach to start with at least helps move an organization in a certain direction as opposed to, um, the full immersion that maybe some organizations they can't quite tolerate yet, yeah. but, but they're willing to, to move in the direction. Yeah. So did folks hear this comment, which was a very useful comment. Yeah. That sometimes you have to start where you can start, which is absolutely true. Right. Um, and I think that I think there was a, a, an important nuance in what you said, which was, you know, you start where you can. Right. And and use that as a lever, right? And use it as a way to figure out how you can take the next step, right? Which I think makes a lot of sense for a lot of organizations. And I think is a, a little different from saying, well, that one will never work here, we'll just pick this one, right? I think that's a, a fabulous way to make a transition. Solve some problem that is causing immediate pain, right? And then you gain some credibility for the next step in the chain people are always more likely to want to do what you ask them to do if you have been helpful to them, rather than if you're coming in and, and, um, and telling them we must do this new, new thing. People don't resist change, they resist coercion. Okay, so on to some ideas about what we can do to improve our success rate with Agile adoption <coughs> and transitioning to Agile. 
Um, in many software organizations, we really value a deep knowledge and understanding of technical skills. Is that true in your organization? Yes? How many of you would also agree that you value a deep understanding of people and teams and systems? Yay, a couple hands went up. Yeah, so it's some people, some organizations do. But if we are going to work in a team-based environment, then as people who are working in the world of Agile and as managers working in organizations that are trying to bring Agile methods into a realized business uh, value, um, we need to really build our awareness on a number of different levels. We need to build our self-awareness, right? Uh, who shows up when we show up and what impact do the messages that we are sending have on the teams. Right? We need to build our understanding of goal-oriented social units, some of which are teams. I see a lot, a lot, a lot of misinformation about teams out there. I have heard people refer to groups as large as 100 as a team, which um, defies all the sociological research about teams. You know, maybe maybe a, a, a collection of teams or an aggregation of teams or a collection of coactive groups, but you know, a group of 100 functions very, very differently than a group of seven on many, many ways. So we need to really boost our awareness of that. And we need to boost our awareness of systems and how systems function. Um, software development is complex. Or large organizations are complex. Even small organizations are complex. And we can't, we, the level of thinking that has gotten us here, deterministic thinking, is not sufficient to get us to the next level with Agile methods. So we have to pay as much attention to the way humans work as we do to the technical skills. It starts with the self, really understanding you know, our self, our thoughts, our feelings, what's playing out in the organization, what triggers our strong emotions, what, um, what, what biases we're bringing. We have to challenge our own assumptions about what's going on in the world and what's going on around us. <coughs> We need to hone our observation skills and become aware of the things that we typically don't see, as well as the things that we do see, what our own filters are, so we can help enhance our skills. Um, in most organizations, we are used to thinking about individual performance and looking at it as if, if we have the best people, we will have great results. That's all we need to think about. If we have the best individuals, everything will work. Um, but then we ignore the fact that um, a team is a social unit that has its own set of dynamics and it has its own set of requirements. Uh, I read some interesting research um, that matches my, my observations of the world that 60% of variation in team pro productivity comes from the design of the team. Does that surprise anyone? No, because you're very wise. You know, so the design of the team has to do with you know who is on the team, what what are their skills for the task at hand, both technical skills, domain knowledge, and interpersonal skills, collaboration skills. Um, what's the goal? Is it a compelling goal? Right. Um, if you want to take advantage of intrinsic in, in, intrinsic motivation, you really need to have a goal that people can engage in and feel connected. And that is very often a goal that has to do with making the lives of some other people better or solving some problem that's a challenging problem. Right? Um, meeting, a, meeting a quarterly sales goal or um, you know, getting a product out the door uh, on a certain date because the senior executive made a bet on the golf course is not a goal that will engage people. Right? It needs to be a compelling and challenging goal that people will look at. Um, you need to look at whether they have the enabling structures in place, whether they have information about the problem, about the domain, about the technology, if they have access to education and expertise, if they have the material support they need, if they have that, that connection back to the organization in terms of vast feedback loops, recognition for the work they're doing, understanding of how their work fits in. Right? We need to become experts in this. Um, some organizations, um, have a belief that 
if they set people in competition against each other, they will achieve greater results. This is the thought process behind a ranking. This is the thought process behind um, you know, setting up competitions where you have one person who's a winner and everyone else is a loser. Um, it's really, in general, more effective to focus the competition outside the organization rather than setting people in competition themselves. Um, and we need to make sure that our, our HR policies are, are supporting teams to function rather than, than just supporting individual accomplishment. Um, we need to encourage double loop learning, which is a way of helping people examine their assumptions. I think we're pretty good at um, doing that sort of incremental improvement and saying, well, here's what we did, and this is what we intended with our results, how can we improve our actions? Um, and we need to take that a step back and say, were our actions the correct actions? Right? In what situations would this action be appropriate and be helpful? In what situations would it not be appropriate or helpful? Um, I sometimes use, use this in retrospectives, right? because if, this is one of my niggling concerns about retrospectives, is that they're just asking people to do better at what they're doing, and if they're doing the wrong thing, they're just doing the wrong thing, right? Or, right, as Freyer Stein likes to say it. Um, so examining our assumptions, why do we think this will work? Why do we think this is the best thing to do? What are our other options? How could this make things worse? You know, that's an interesting question. Do any of you ever ask that when you're problem solving? How could we make this worse? It's, it's, it's a question that shows you where some of your control points are that you may not have thought of. So that's another way to examine assumptions. As managers, I think we need to step back from the events that's where we need to focus. We focus on the events that are coming at us. And as managers, stuff is coming at us every day. We need to step back so we have some time to reflect um, and, and, and begin to see patterns. I have a very dear friend who tells me that she, um, she became a much better manager after the birth of her daughter because she, she was breastfeeding and she had to sit alone in her office every day and get her pump. Um, and she wasn't a person who necessarily always took out time for reflection, but she had to sit there and she had to be by herself and she had time to think. So don't wait to have a baby to do it. <laughs> you know, find some time to step back and think. Um, when we step back and we stop just focusing on the day-to-day -day events, the, the now and the near term, we can begin to see patterns. And then we can um, observe those and we can depict them. Now, uh, humans are not particularly good at seeing change that is slow and incremental or seeing patterns that repeat at a great, when there's a great um, interval of time in between. So we need to learn some skills to depict those. And we need to look at data to understand trends. Right? We um, tend to focus on looking at targets and measuring for targets. Targets don't tell us much. Trends tell us a lot. Once we understand some of the patterns, that can give us some hints to the underlying structures that exist in our organizations that are driving the behavior. How many of you were in my workshop on, on system thinking and How many of you were, uh, yeah. So, so we talked about some specific tools to start under, understanding the dynamics of, that are driving patterns of behavior understanding some of the structures that drive behavior. And I think this is one of the important new roles that managers can take on when they um, move away from focusing you know, down on a team and meeting their, their, their narrow objectives. They can begin to look laterally across the organization and do work that is incredibly important for the organization, which is understanding the underlying dynamics working to improve the system rather than optimizing their piece of it, uh, working to improve the entire system so that the entire system will function better and raise up the level of the entire organization and their ability to function. So, um, 
I think we have some time for questions. If you have additional questions. Well, we are ready to go make it so then, right? All right. I am Esther Derby. I'm at Esther Derby on Twitter. How many of you are on Twitter? Yeah, I love Twitter. Um, I'm surprised that I love Twitter, but I do love Twitter. Um, you can read more about my thoughts on um, these topics at my website. And I would love to hear from you as you go out and explore these things and tell me stories about what you're doing and how you're applying some of these thoughts. just hopefully going to support you and help you as you were oh, trying to think okay. through that was to say I think the complexity theory is a really good thing to look at where your organization is and you need to understand where you are in order to move forward so all of these tools you've put up here are really great and so yeah. on but we shouldn't look at them as cookie cutter tools no right and and so we have to look at them in light of where are we in, in you know when you talk about complexity theory what part of the quadrant are we in you know, you got to look at it. And, and that applies, of course, to anything we're talking about, lean or agile or so. There are no cookie cutters. Yes, the job is by itself. It's basically, I think, it's saying you cannot control things. Yes. But so we can influence and we can uh, uh, have some tools to, for our leverage, but we cannot predict. Correct. All right, so thank you. That gave me a jumping off. <laughs> oh, excellent. Oh, excellent. Major dollar. Um, so. <laughs> <coughs> so, um, you, I, when you talk about quadrants, I assume you're um, talking either about space or commitment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I was okay. saying, yeah. So, one of the ways I apply this is um, if you consider, you know, taking off that, that set of quadrants where this is close to agreement and certainty, and this is far from agreement and certainty, from an organizational standpoint, if you're up here, we would say this is unorganized. And this is the area of discovery. 
this is where you are if you want to be finding a new product, researching a new market. You know, you're up there, you want high diversity of cognitive diversity. You want very few constraints, not, not zero constraints, but few constraints. Um, and you want to um, you have fairly open, open feedback loops so that people don't feel like they have to report every few minutes, right? If you're down in this part where you're close to agreement and you're close to certainty, this would, would be considered organized. And this is the world of routine work. This is where I want accounting to be. Right? You don't need a whole lot of cognitive diversity down here. The um, procedures are pretty locked down. Policies are pretty locked down. The work is pretty known. So this is highly constrained. You need intelligence to do it, right? You need a lot of intelligence to do it. But it's, 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 it's pretty certain. And there's a high level agreement about what actually needs to happen. In this area in between, this is the area we call self-organizing, which is sort of spelled that way. Um, and this is the work of, of um, judgment, uh, heuristics, expertise, where much of software development lives. So from an understanding of where we are as an organization, um, we need to know what the work we're doing is. Right? If we're in discovery, we might need to loosen up our constraints. If we're here, we want to be careful. We want to be cognizant of creating enough of a container that people know what direction they're headed in, but they're not so over-constrained that they can't bring any creativity to bear. And if you're down here, um, you really need to be you know, routine work then, then it's highly constrained. So this also um, coincides with the life of many companies. So if you look at McDonald's for a very simple example that's been written up a number of times, um, when they first started, they were in discovery trying to figure out what kind of <coughs> restaurant they'd be, what kind of model they have. And then they, they narrowed it down and they started getting good at um, understanding their market and adjusting and experimenting to their market and now they're down here utterly and completely routinized, you know, down to the number of split seconds that something is in the pressure cooker. Um, the problem with this is if you are routinized and you need to get some innovation in your company, how do you get back up here or here? And it's through the way you handle the constraints in your organization. Um, in terms of cognitive um, variety, in terms of how tightly contained goals are, and how tight the feedback loops are. So this is a this is a model that I find very useful for looking at organizations, understanding where they are and where they need to be to accomplish the work they're looking at. Um, this is about fit for function. It's not one isn't good or bad. So this is one of the things. Is, is, is this helpful? Is this kind of where you? Yeah. Okay. Absolutely. So, and this comes out of the work of Linda Oyang, who's, who's done some very interesting thinking about this work and translating it to you. So, um, I'd be happy to talk some more about that. There was a question in the back. Yeah, I'll have a comment and then a question. Okay. So, I really like the, how, how you were mentioning how the language is really important. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I talked to a guy uh, recently who was, I mean, he was really depressed because his, his uh, project had been canceled after three months because they figured out that the technical solution they were proposing was not feasible, it wasn't going to scale, right? And I thought it was fabulous, right? Because in many organizations, that sort of project goes on for years. 
right? But they 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 failed fast. Yeah. What was behind in that organization was that they didn't have a mechanism to recognize that as a success. Right. Right. So so that um, that's something they need to work on is figuring out how they can make it okay for people to say, oh well, we realized that this wasn't going to work in three months instead of six years yeah. or six months or whatever. And then yeah. that's Pardon? And then, and then treat it as a success. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Right. And we are very, very conditioned to not do that. You know, there's this can-do attitude. If we just try hard enough. And sometimes, you know, if we try hard enough, we'll make it. And sometimes, you know, we can't with, with what we know now. self-direction a team has and there are teams that are um, self-directed to the extent that they choose the direction they're going to go in and sometimes they are explicitly chartered that way saying okay you this team you go out and figure out what our next generation product should be right but then they are chartered by the organization to do that right so they still have that tie back to the organization um, in most cases for most teams the goal still comes from management in one shape, form, or another, um, either development managers or product managers. And I think that um, we are in Agile, we're missing something by just having that order backlog. Because that, um, you know, just sometimes it feels to me like people are just pulling something like, like, you know, hamsters pressing the little lever and getting the next pellet, right? And that's not, that's not very engaging. Right, so I, I think it takes some thought on the part of either the product owner or, the, or people who are in a manning or close to the team to really frame that in a way that is resonant to the people working on it and connects back to the customer. Why does this matter to the customer to the people who are building this software for? Um, why is it important for the company that we do this? Um, but of course, the, the team would be committing to how much of that they so I think it depends, but it always has to be explicit within the organization about where you are in that spectrum. I, I do still run to, into teams that say, you know, we're self-organizing, don't tell us what to do. <coughs> it's like, no, you're here to build this particular product. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. All right. Other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you.